what I shared in that prayer request and praise had a confusing element to it. We are having youth group this Thursday. So this Thursday, we're on schedule. It's the following after that. Well, on the screen, Luke chapter 13. Hey, that run. That's cool. On the screen, Luke chapter 13. If you have your Bibles, I think you're going to benefit because you may, we may be jumping around a little and you may have a thought and you want to find something around the verses we're looking at here. But if you don't have a Bible, it's right up behind me here. Luke chapter 13, I'm going to read this and I'm going to share something straight from my heart. There were present at that season some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. He also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, Look! For three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, Sir, leave it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well. But if not, after that you can cut it down. There isn't a time when I don't tremble when I come to the Word of God. I know my limitations. I, no, I don't even know my limitations. I just know I'm limited. I know my weaknesses. And I know that I can never communicate this teaching, especially this parable, the way that our Lord expressed it straight from his lips. But I also know he's promised that his spirit is alive. And his spirit speaks through his living word. So we can all hear Jesus teach these words directly to us this morning. Even if it goes through me. Listen to what the word of God says to you this morning. Speaking of this morning. My alarm went off at 142 or so I thought. I get up really early on Sunday mornings but not that early. And it took me a while to realize that was not my alarm. That was a phone call. And it was a call from Southern Coos Hospital. And it was a nurse at the nurse station in the emergency room. And she told me that there was a patient, there was someone who needed to speak with a chaplain. I can't tell you how excited I was because we had a service in this town pastors were on a rotation but that rotation has not continued covid kind of disrupted all that and we've tried once to get it back up again but nothing has come to, to fruition and I'm, i was shocked that they even still had the call list but this nurse found the call list she called and so i i got over there as soon as i could and when i walked in i instantly recognized the man in the bed, some of you will know who he is, Rick Fouch. Rick came here, oh, maybe two years ago, probably came about a dozen times. He was a friend of Andy and Victoria. Victoria worked with him at the hospital. He was a doctor. And Rick went home to be with Jesus today. And I had the privilege, although he could not speak, 
I was able to read scripture over him and to pray with him. He had his friend there with him, and she's the one that, that wanted, wanted me to, wanted a chaplain to come. And we prayed over him, and as we were reading the word, he fell asleep. I want to tell you about Rick as we look at this text, because I had a different text in mind, and the Lord just just pushed this on my heart. Rick fought against the Lord so much in his life. And I don't know much of his past life. Uh, we had a bond. One thing that we had in common was we were baseball nuts. And he was just a baseball-holic. I always love it when I can talk with someone who can rattle off stats. And he was right there. The only problem with Rick, he was a Cardinal fan. He wasn't a Padre fan. He was, as crazy as I am as for the Padres, he was double crazy for the Cardinals. Much better team, except for this year. <laughs> anyway, um, but Rick and I, we would get together. We would have some conversations, some conversations right here in the center aisle after church that lasted a long time. We went out for coffee. But Rick had just, late in life, come to seek the Lord, just just about three years ago, but he had many hard questions, and he had anger in his heart, and he would level some of the hardest questions I've, I've had in quite a while about God, and, and some, some of the things he would say really troubled me, like, careful, Rick, what you're saying, and the more we talked, he was working through what the Lord was doing in his life, but the last time I talked to Rick, the last time we had a spiritual conversation, I was very, very troubled because he was kind of wavering. Like, I don't know if I can believe in, in a God that allows suffering. Well, last night at 6 o'clock, Rick was still walking around, talking, and then all of a sudden, he just shut down and he was aware enough to tell his caretaker I think I have a brain bleed and he's a doctor and he knew exactly what was happening and his brain started to bleed and they rushed him right to the hospital and it was only just a matter of hours before God took him he just went quickly I'm encouraged because this friend who was there has spent a lot of time with Rick over the last year, and she told me that he had fully trusted in the Lord. He still had some, some issues in his heart he had to work through, but he held to the Lord, and he had a burden for his family. And I want us to be praying for his family. They are, from what I understand, they are not saved. But it made me just... As I was driving home, this passage, the Lord just laid it on my heart. Look at verse 6 again. He also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the keeper of his vineyard, Look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? And he answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well. But if not, after that, you can cut it down. Oh, this is such, I tremble so much at this text. Jesus is revealing the way God chases after and is long-suffering for, and is patient, and is desiring the salvation of the sinner, the one who will not bear fruit, the one who says, no, I will not live for Jesus, I will not surrender my life to God, I will give some, some to God, maybe, I will take some of his word, some of his pretty good principles, but I cannot be all in. God does not give up on that soul. God chases after that soul. God disturbs. 
that soul. The Lord has to disturb us in order to save us. And I tell you, Rick had very disturbing questions and struggles, things that a lot of us may be struggling with. But he didn't have this lifelong journey with Christ. He was coming to the Lord late in life, and he had a lot of baggage, but he was seeking God, and he had to go. He would go for a while. Everything was going great, and then something would happen. God, where are you now? And looking back on his life, oh, praise the Lord. It was in those times that the master gardener had to disturb his roots, had to get out the master's shears and prune and cut and reshape and wound so that Rick, so that his faith would grow stronger and that he would not give up hope that there is a God who loves him, that there is a holy God, as we sang, holy forever, we fall down, holy, holy, holy. Rick had to know that there is a holy, righteous God, even though all these injustices are happening in this fallen world, God is on the throne and he will not be mocked. God is sovereign. And he knows what we need. There has to be a holy disturbing in our hearts in order for us to bear the fruit of salvation, the fruits of repentance leading to salvation. There has to be at times the biting pain of the master's shear, cutting away those things that are hindering us, cutting away those things that are becoming dead weight. Oh, I went so long being a horrible gardener trying to manage our fruit trees. And the poor tr fruit trees have, have had to bear the brunt of my stupidity so many years not pruning them. And they got so big, one, one of them split in the storm and I had to prop it up and, and there was disease that came in after that. I've butchered them now this last season in a good way. I had, had some good advice from Bob's neighbor. And they're starting to show new life now. But for so long, I had neglected them. Praise God, there's not a moment, there's not a season that God neglects us. That God turns away and says, I, I give up. He is always working. He is always calling. Even when we don't see it, even when we don't feel it. And there's times... When he has to cut and prune, there's other times when we have to feel the hard, unrelenting blade of a trowel, of a shovel, and he's got to dig, and he's got to disturb our roots, and he's got to move us and transplant us in a place that we don't want to go. The cold steel coupled with his warm fingers that come, but those fingers tear apart our roots at times, spread them apart so that we can absorb the nutrients better in the soil where he has planted us. I watched yesterday, I watched Philip and I watched Song work their magic out here. If you didn't see it coming in, come out here and look at the sidewalk right outside this door. There's a little area in the sidewalk where we took some lavender that was growing wild in the back over here in the parking lot and transplanted it. And I watched as those plants were transported, what, 100, 150 feet away, brought over here, and they were laid on their side while the ground was being prepped, and I saw those roots just like, ah, exposed. But the loving care and the, and the, the precision in digging a hole, shaping the ground, covering it to keep, make sure the weeds won't Come and choke out that plant and then put it in the soil, spreading out the, the ground and everything, the, the roots, just so that it can take hold. I watched that. It's going to be beautiful. You go out there, you don't just see it, you smell it. I love the smell of that lavender. I almost ruined it with, with what I was doing out there. Thankfully, they, they rescued them. But whatever it is, God has to to disturb us. The gospel is offensive to the flesh. If the gospel 
has not been offensive to you, something's wrong. We are in desperate need to have our hearts shaken to the core, disturbed. Because when we're in default mode, the flesh just says, I got it. I'm just going to live day to day. I'm going to do what I feel best. As Solomon said, there is a way that seems best to a man. The bummer is that way leads to death. That way leads to destruction. And if we go in our default mode, we're going straight to hell and happy about it. But God comes down and he shakes us and he says, stop. Turn and live, as he says in, in the book of Ezekiel. Turn, turn and live. Why should you die? And God is willing that none should perish, but that all, that's a big word, all should come to repentance. At one point, Jesus was talking, and he was talking about the kingdom of heaven, about salvation, what it means. And he says, I am the life. I am the bread of life. And unless you feed upon my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part in me. And people said, what? What? Unless you eat my flesh, the bread of life, unless you feed upon me like the bread that sustains us, we need to eat. We need sustenance for our physical bodies. Unless you feed upon me and unless my blood that will be shed for you, unless you Take my blood and let it flow through your veins. You have no part in me. And it says that when he spoke that, many turned and walked away. Multitudes walked away. And it got so bad that Jesus had to turn around to his disciples and say, do you also want to leave? Why would Jesus offend the masses? Because, as he pointed out earlier, they just wanted their belly full. He had already fed them with the loaves and the fishes, the miraculous feeding of the thousands. And they just wanted another quick fix. Give us another good story. Oh, and we love that fish and bread dinner you made. Can we have another one? They wanted what the flesh desired. Give it to me here, now, just like I want it. And Jesus had to disturb them so much that they left. But that was necessary. They were being lulled to sleep. And Jesus had to say, you need to have your roots ripped up. Do you understand? I am the life. You come to me looking for life. I am the life. You either accept me or you have no life. In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus spoke these offensive words. He says, do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace. What? Well, the angel said, peace on earth, goodwill to men, right? When, when Jesus was born, that was the message. The Messiah has come, peace on earth. Amen. He is our peace. Peace came to earth. Peace is only found in the person of Jesus Christ. But Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace. The peace of the world that everyone's trying to find, a kind of peace that will just, will bend God's will and God's rules, even if it means holding on to our relationship and rejecting his word. I, I just can't have something come between my, my wife or my, my son or my daughter. It's just too important. God is not worth it enough to lose this or that. Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring the truth that says you must Repent and be saved of your sin. I am the way, 
way, the truth, and the life. Come to me. And it's disturbing. It's offensive. The gospel is offensive. But praise the Lord, the gospel is restorative. Once we're offended, once we understand that we need a Savior, that's when the love of God says, and I provided a way. You can be saved. Once we're awakened to our sin, we say, oh, Lord, is there any hope for me? As Rick came to the point in his life where he said, there has to be more than this life, the suffering. I can't read the news anymore. It just troubles me. There has to be something. Why are all these people suffering? I don't know if you remember, it was what, a couple years ago, someone drove their car into a parade and killed a bunch of people. And Rick says, I can't believe in a God who would allow that. Now, that's a whole nother topic. Lord willing, we'll get to that. Why do people suffer if God is so good? And I had a lot of conversations with Rick. But that, that was offensive. And he had to come to grips with there's something more to this life. There's justice. But where is it? I don't see it. If God is holy, where is he? Once we're at that point, then the Holy Spirit works so point, pointedly on the heart and on the conscience. Come to me. Let's reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. And the invitation is always come. God loved the world so much that he sent his son to die for us so that we can live, that all who believe in his son, Jesus Christ, should live and not perish. Oh, man, there's a lot here. What an indictment. Getting back to this parable, we have the caretaker of the vineyard. He says, or the owner, rather. Look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. For three years I have come looking for fruit in my vineyard from my tree, and I found nothing. It's painfully tragic that God came all the way down from glory, lowering himself, lower than the angels, taking upon himself the nature of man, experiencing the suffering of this fallen world, the world that he created perfect, all for the sake and the purpose of redeeming, redeeming fallen man who rejected him. And he came to suffer all of that, yet he came to man and man rejected him. There was no fruit of repentance. As Jesus says in the Revelation, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. But that door has to be opened. God has given us a free will. And God came to his creation. And he said, Come! And he disturbed them. And he troubled them with his teachings. No man ever spoke like this. Oh, his teachings were wonderful. And his stories were amazing. And they moved the heart. And people just fell in love with our Lord Jesus. But when it came to the truth of repentance, many were offended to the point where they walked away and followed no more. What an indictment. I have come to my vineyard to my tree, but there is no fruit. The proof of salvation is the fruit of righteousness that is born from the Spirit of God within us. If you are saved, then you have turned from sin and you have faith in Jesus Christ and His Spirit is in you and His Spirit is working life in you to bear fruit by this all men will know that you're my disciples, that you have loved one another, and that you bear fruit. We must bear the fruit of righteousness, not our own righteousness. We don't earn it. It's not a legalistic, okay, I'm going to be good now that I'm a Christian. It's allowing the Spirit of God. God imputes His righteousness through the blood of Jesus Christ upon us. 
incredible. Not only does he disturb the roots, but he, he nurses, he feeds, he restores, he waters so that we can bear fruit. And God never fails. God never fails. He never fails to give a soul every opportunity to turn to him. He never fails to give that soul who turns to him in faith and true repentance. He never fails to give them life and life more abundant. He never fails to forsake them on their journey of faith. Even if at times they don't know where he is. God, where are you? He's right there. Paul says, though he's not far from each one of us. Sometimes we need to grope in the darkness so that our faith stretches out and God helps us to have our faith be ready to receive the answer that we are seeking. But he's not far from each one of us, praise his name. But there's no fruit. And the owner says, why should it use up the ground? Wow. Wow. Why should it use up the ground? Think about everything that's poured into one plant by a master gardener. And think about the amount of ground it takes for that plant to thrive. It's not just that little spot that you see where the stem comes out, that little patch of ground. No, there's the ground around it. There's the ground underneath it. And there needs to be room for the, the roots to grow down, to grow out. If it's gorse, it'll grow two miles out in every direction. It takes a lot of ground. It takes a lot of effort. Why does it use up the ground? Is there anyone here? Oh, I hope not. But is there anyone here that is simply just using up the ground that God has provided you? And all the efforts, all the godly people praying for you, reaching out, demonstrating God's love, calling you to, to trust in him. Is there anyone here who says it's just not enough? I can't, I can't yield all the way to that. You know, there is this parable in some ways may be one of the most misunderstood parables because many have looked at this and they understand, okay, the owner of the vineyard is God, the father, Right? And he's planted the vineyard. Where's the tree? And he's angry. He's an angry God. Three years I've come and there's nothing. Why should I tolerate this anymore? Cut it down. And then you have the keeper of the garden, the keeper of the vineyard. And he is the loving, kind, gracious Jesus. And Jesus stands in between us and an angry father and says, wait, wait, wait. Don't take it out on him, please. And it's, it's Jesus being kind for us. And it's God being angry, the father being angry. And, and he's holding back the wrath. And somehow we hope that he wins the father over. And the father will say, okay, just once. That is not at all what Jesus is saying. Do you understand that it says Jesus himself said the father sent. He loved the world so much that he sent me. He loved you so much that he sent me. And who is Jesus? Oh, every Wednesday night we have a, a Bible study and a prayer time at 7 o'clock. And Don is taking us right now through a series on the person of Jesus Christ. And I want you to, to come if you can, 7 o'clock. I will be here definitely this Wednesday. But I hope you can make it. We, we talked about the incarnation. We talked about what it meant for God to become man. God didn't send Jesus 
and remain God from afar and say, okay, I sent you my son. He's going to try to clean you guys up. If you don't, it's over. God came down to us as Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. God became flesh. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that in the person of Jesus Christ, the fullness of the Godhead dwelt bodily. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. There is no separation between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Even though they are three distinct persons, they are. it is one God we serve. One Lord, one Savior. Jesus and God, who is infinite, became finite. Man, somehow, great is the mystery. We can't wrap our minds around it. But God sent his Son. The Son of God became the Son of Man. And the Bible says that it is the Son of Man that died for our sins. And by faith in the Son of Man, we will be saved. Even though he still remains the Son of God, fully God, fully man. If Jesus is not God, there's no hope for any plant, for any tree. We're all lost. But God, because he loved us. And there's not an angry God and a nice God. There is one God. And we see here God's justice. But his justice is governed at the same time by mercy. And mercy triumphs over judgment. And in the face of Jesus Christ, we see clearly who God is. You want to know who the Father is? Look to Jesus. You want to know who the Spirit is? Look at Jesus. Jesus is God fully revealed to man. He is the one who goes to work in his vineyard. This is his vineyard. But he lowered himself, lower than the angels. Oh, if I have time, I'll read that passage quickly. I won't read this whole passage, but in Isaiah chapter 5. Hey, Kelly, did you? Yeah, you already got it up. Maybe it's been up for a while. Yeah. In, in chapter 5 of Isaiah, he likens the children of Israel to this a, a, a plant in a vineyard, to a vineyard that is fruitless. And in verse 4, right before that, he says, I have come to my people, but, and I, I expected to find fruit, he says in chapter 5, but there was none. In verse 4 on our screen, it says, What more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it. What more could have been done? You know, you look at our parable, and Jesus said, for three years I've come. Is it any stretch at all? He would talk about indictment. Jesus says, I have come, but to the lost sheep of Israel. Jesus came to the Jews. He came for all mankind, but he came specifically to the children of Israel to turn the hearts of the children back to the Father. And he, he walked, once he revealed himself in his ministry, for three, three and a half years. For three years I've come, but there's no fruit. But there's just a little more time. And in, in just a matter of months, maybe, but after he, he shared this, very, very short time, the cross would claim the Son of Man, the Son of God, for us. But there's still time. And Jesus said, there's more to be done. The hour's not come yet. And when the hour had come, he says, now it is time. And when he breathed his last, he said, it is finished. And now no man can say, but I didn't know. I didn't have a chance to be saved. Because what more could have been done than Jesus dying on the cross for you and rising from the dead on his own accord, by his own strength, the Bible says, he rose from the dead, proving that the curse is broken. And we know that our faith will not be shaken if we put it in the, the Son of Jesus. Of, 
the Son of God, Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. What more could have been done? Nothing could have been done. Let me, I'm going to quickly read Hebrews chapter 2, and then I'm going to bring this to a close. Hebrews 2, 9 through 18. Let this wash over you. Think about the vineyard and all that he's doing for one soul, just for one soul. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all one. For this reason, he is not ashamed. Jesus is not ashamed to call us brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I and the children whom God has given me. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he, Jesus, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed he does not give, give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered the intempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. He is able. What more could he do? What more could he have done? What more will he be able to do for you and for me if we are rejecting him right now? He has made everything possible for us to be saved and to bear fruit. Have you surrendered all to Jesus Christ? You know, this would be, it would, it would be a heartwarming sermon. If I just left it at, look at all that he has done for us to be saved. We can be saved. But the parable doesn't end there. Can you put that last? Oh, I think Jesus had me. But he answered, verse 8, and said to, to him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well, praise God. That's the end result. That's the God desires that none should perish, but all come to repentance. That's the will of God. If it bears fruit, well, but we got to finish it. But if not, after that, you can cut it down. What does it mean to be cut down? Now, there may be many. In fact, there are many, many cuts, preceding cuts to this last final cut that Jesus is referring to here. There are many attempts, as Jesus himself proved, in the flesh of God coming to us, chasing after us, ministering to us, pleading with us. Even now, the Bible says that the Spirit of Christ yearns and intercedes for us at all times. Many cuts, many prunings, many wounds to turn us back to him. But if all of those are rejected and we still hold on to our stubbornness and rebellion, there is one cut that will not be mocked or removed. It is final. What does it mean? To be cut down. Solomon says there's a time for everything under the sun. A time and a season for everything. And in that list he gives, he says there's a time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted. 
It was because of our sin that mankind brought the curse of death on ourselves. Death of the body, yes. But much more than that, the fall of mankind brought death to our soul. Spiritual death. And the only way that we could be restored from eternal separation, eternal death, was for the Father to send the Son and to turn the people, his people, back to him to provide atonement, sacrifice for our sins. But if that is rejected, Jesus taught this parable in John chapter 15 of the branch and the vine. In verse 6, he says, If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. Please bear with me just a few more minutes. I know this is a long sermon, but this is just burning in my heart. To be cut down, Jesus says, is the same as to be removed from the vine. Jesus says, I am the vine. I'm the life. You're the branch. The branch has no life in it unless it's attached to the vine. If you abide in me, I abide in you. My life abides in you. Jesus is the vine. We are the branch. Therefore, we have life in Jesus Christ. And we always have life in Jesus Christ. It is steadfast. It is secure. But if we reject him, Jesus says we are removed. The branch is removed from the vine. It is cast off. It is burned in the fire. What is that fire? That is the fire of hell. And Jesus taught about hell so much. Some have said, I haven't totally figured it out and, and charted it out. But some have said he talked more about hell than he did about heaven. And I believe it because that's why he came. He came to disturb us so that we wouldn't go there. And a gospel that doesn't have a hell, a gospel that doesn't have a judgment day, is just a band-aid on a cancerous sore that has roots that go all the way to the heart. We must repent so that we can be saved. Because if we don't repent, if we don't turn and bear fruit for Christ, we reject him and we are cast off. And that death that mankind experienced all the way back in the garden remains in the heart of every person who rejects Jesus Christ. There is no atonement for a willful sin that will not accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. Praise God, his mercy keeps chasing after us and the Spirit awakens us in conviction and we're for convicted, we cry out and we say, Lord, save me. And he is faithful every time if we repent. He is there to forgive. He's still working on us. But if we reject him, we are cut down thrown in the fire and we are burned and the bible says there jesus there is weeping and gnashing her teeth there is no escape from hell this is our time this is the moment what more could jesus do for you what more could god do for you and me so that we could be saved even this moment right now if you're not he's brought us all here if you are saved oh there's a whole nother sermon for another day. This destroys all desire to judge one another. He is the judge. He knows what the roots need. He knows what that plant needs, that fig tree. He knows when the fruit will bear in its season. Who are you to judge? We need to be so like our Lord and we need to be like that master gardener who tries to be working in others' lives through, through his power. Oh, that we could be there to help encourage someone in their faith, and their journey to find Jesus. If they're struggling, let's walk alongside them. Let's say, he won't leave you. He won't forsake you. Let's pray together. we got to be the church that God's called us to be. We all need to bear fruit. And the church bears fruit as one. A 
the body of Christ. This is what happens when a sermon hits at two in the morning. I got too much to say. What are you going to do at this moment? Praise God. Rick. Rick's journey of faith in this life is over. And now, as the Bible says, that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Rick kept pushing through all of the hurting, all of the pruning. And he's saved now. He's saved. His final salvation. He's one day the trumpet will sound. And he'll receive all the rewards and that, that God has in store for him, just as we will if on that day we can say, yes, Jesus is Lord. I, I surrender to him now in this life. Every tongue will confess on that day Jesus is Lord. But in this life is when we do it willingly. this time. Amen. Oh, it's always best. Laboring and studying always happens. It's always best when the Lord just drops a message on somebody. I tell you, the one thing that's going to happen more often on the day of judgment, when all the books are revealed, all the records among the saved, it's going to be, how come I didn't realize how wonderful he was? I think about the disciples saying when Jesus was asleep in the boat after saying we're going to the other side, they couldn't just trust his word that they're going to the other side. Do you not care that we're drowning? Do you not care? How can you say that to him? Job, I love how he said, I spoke of things too wonderful for me because he got so close that he began to border on condemning God to justify himself. I said when I didn't understand things too wonderful, but now my eyes are open. I think of Mary and Martha, and Mary sitting at Jesus' feet, knowing that that's what matters, trusting him, and Martha in the kitchen making things and coming out angry that Martha, Mary's not helping. Lord, do you not care? Tell my sister to help me. The embarrassment of people thinking that God is this angry God who says, cut it down. No, brother hit it so well. It's not putting a difference between the Father and Jesus. It is the Father so loved us he sent the Son. Jesus said, I do not say I'll pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loves you. It is the justice of God revealed in the parable. The justice is true. Why does it use up the ground? You should be cut down. That's justice. It's the justice of God that says, for three years, for some, he, could he not say, for 30 years, I've invested in you? For 30 years, I've given you a godly example in, in your mother or your grandmother or your, your sister, your wife. Have I not, for 30 years, given you? Could he not say, why justice say? Why does it use up the ground? But what does his mercy say? I love what, oh, it's gone. I'll just have to read it myself. I love what it says. Let me dig around it. Mercy says, let me dig around it. Let me disturb its roots. Let's get some oxygen, some nourishment. Let's dig around it. If it bears fruit, well, that is the greatest line in that whole thing. If it bears fruit, well, that's God's desire. I don't care that it's been worthless for 30 years. If it bears fruit, yes. After all this investment, why should we start all the way over with another tree? Yes, if it bears fruit, well. That's how God feels about you. He is not willing to give up. This is one of my favorite scriptures to quote when I preach. From James chapter, chapter 4. I'm sorry. Chapter 2. For judgment is without, is without mercy to the one who shows no mercy. And in this line. Mercy triumphs over judgment. The judgment of God says, cut it down. You've had enough time. 
You've, been, you, you've had more than enough. You've had the, the shelter of this vineyard. You've had someone caring for you, someone watering you, someone you give. Cut it down. But the mercy of God triumphs over judgment. Let me spend a little time disturbing it, digging at it. God, this is a truth. You can write this down. This is a theological truth that will open up your understanding of God. God is merciful until it's unjust for him to be so. It is never that he runs out of mercy. It's just there's a point where it's unjust to keep extending it. There's a point where it's got to be cut down. If it succeeds, if it works well, but otherwise, cut it down. There's a point where it's no longer mercy, but it's not even tolerance. It's enabling wrong to go on using up the ground but if it can if you can be rescued it is well with you the bible says oh now i'm doing it now i'm preaching a long message you've had enough today i know but this is the truth he is better than your best thoughts his mercy is pulling for you what he wants is for it to triumph over judgment and it starts with believing the character of God is good. The character of God cares. The character of God is not willing that anyone should perish. It starts with believing that he works all things together for good. The character of God is wonderful, that he causes us to seek for him and grope for him, that we might find him, though he's not far from every one of us hovering over us day in and we live and move and have our being that he wants our hearts to turn to him it is true mercy triumphs over judgment jesus is proof of that the cross has triumphed over everything that said you deserve hell would you stand Oh, Lord, I think about the, the things that Rick said, Lord, that he's embarrassed about now as he, as he rejoices in you. I think about the things that Peter and Martha said, and Lord, the stupid things that we have said. You are wonderful. Oh, God, you are able. You are willing. You do not want us cut down. You just see the whole picture and know what really is needed. You will even disturb the roots until we realize what a good and gracious God you are. You will wait, as Isaiah said, in order to be gracious to us. Thank you for this word. Thank you that in spite of Rick's struggles, Rick came to place his faith in the goodness of God. Lord, thank you for your bearing with each one of us in this room, not only knowing the numbers of the hair of our head, but every intricate thing about our emotional state, our mental state, our everything, and saying if it bears fruit well. Thank you that you want it to be well with our soul. God, you've been speaking today. Let not a heart harden themselves or seek to quench but the spirit of God is revealed today we pray in Jesus name